Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and those with epicene qualities. I'm Kojima Powered, and thank you very much for joining me. This vlog was inspired by various YouTubers, so I'll be sharing my perspective and examining some pervasive arguments I've encountered regarding gender, biology, and the correct usage of pronouns. I intend to clarify why I feel so many people such as myself are reluctant to redefine our understanding of objective reality and placate to one's unique sense of personhood. I've always attempted to align the reasoning behind my actions to that which is evident or at least highly probable. Biology is everywhere, and its prescriptive taxonomy informs the way I accept men, women, and those with epicene qualities. Thus, I think it goes without saying that my masculine and feminine pronouns will be appropriated accordingly. As usual with my examinations, I assert all my points with degrees of certainty and confidence. Now, I want to be open and honest about this. I'm not a part of this online destroyer culture. I find it counterproductive, and you're not going to persuade anyone by humiliating them. Everyone's human, and thus anyone can accept the proposition, even though the reasoning is invalid. Myself included. The logical fallacy I fell victim to was argumentum ad populum. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat... <laughs> to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. I had no excuse. I didn't want to be on the wrong side of history. The pressure to project uniformity is an insidiously powerful motivator. It's easier, even convenient, to fall in line with everyone else. And this also holds true for language. So, it's a matter of great personal humiliation that I confess I used to use transgender people's pronouns based on preference. Convincing or otherwise, I called men she and women he. I practiced a lot and achieved some reasonable proficiency at speaking the slang of it. It was convenient, although it didn't mean anything on an intellectual level but it made a lot of trans people happy in reaffirming the zeitgeist surrounding gender identity. But you gotta understand that that validation was insincere. Surreptitiously, I censored my reasoning and contentions and forced myself to adopt an erroneous grammatical architecture because if I thought I did long enough, it would make sense and feel like my language. By way of social pressure, argument mad populum, I was indoctrinating myself to accept something for reasons I didn't share with my peer group. So, as time went on, I can't explain why, my pronouns started sounding more and more sarcastic, until eventually I abandoned using pronouns based on preference altogether. I don't want to fall for what some people deem appropriate. I need my social behavior to be modified for valid forms of reasoning. So, in the spirit of this great honesty, I'm going to examine our first argument. But people, we have to listen to the science. And the science says we're all on a spectrum. If you haven't seen it, Bill Nye sees the world as a politically correct presentation meant to address our understanding of what defines a man, woman, or intersex person. Specifically, there was an episode about gender that contrives a plurality of ways that men and women can be understood, and thus legitimized. It was thought-provoking. How do we know the difference between men, women, and intersex people? Well, the three facets of sexual differentiation in Homo sapiens are XY sex determination, your karyotype, differentiation, the process of development of the differences between males and females from an undifferentiated zygote, and gender identity. However, gender identity is unique in respect to XY sex determination and differentiation in that it contributes no tangible influence to sexual differentiation, the biological basis in which I align my pronouns. Gender identity is culturally defined, and thus intrinsically subjective. There is the way you identify and the way that you're identified by others. It's impossible to legitimately correct someone's subjective interpretation and dictate which pronouns they should use by appealing to an equally subjective interpretation. You're gonna give me my fucking money back. Excuse me, sir, there's a young man in here. Oh, no. Excuse, no. Me, Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. I can call the police if you'd like me to. You need to settle down. You need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. An argument from repetition with a distinct appeal to violence may seem persuasive but they're not valid forms of reasoning. To put it bluntly, the mantra gender is a spectrum is as true as it is irrelevant. It's a red herring preemptively employed in argument to divert our attentions that the only difference between men and women is biological. 
Gender identity itself has no explanatory power without appealing to biology to provide a metric on which to gauge masculinity or femininity. Take this guy, for example. The fascinating thing is, as much as we try to label things, there is no way to label every point on an infinite continuum, and that's what we're dealing with here. So, to actually visualize how this works, I've created a graph for you. On the x-axis, we have gender, male to female. I'm going to stop right here. Inside of this model explaining the gender spectrum, we can identify two distinct appeals to biology. Let's continue. Let's also put a hypothetical biological female on the graph that identifies very strongly as a man. Now that could be really uncomfortable, especially when there's a bunch of people in the world who insist on calling him a woman just because of the body that he happens to be very uncomfortable with. Which is why sex does not determine the pronoun you should use. Gender does. Let's examine the reasoning behind gender. It seems hypocritical to say that I should base my pronouns on gender instead of biology, but then describe the gender spectrum by appealing to the biology you told me to dismiss. In argument, this is an appeal to the stolen concept fallacy, which is requiring the truth of something that you're simultaneously trying to disprove. I just wish that people would stop exploring newer and more fallacious ways to get offended. I want to make clear that I'm criticizing the argument and not the person. Rejecting an irrational argument is not a form of harm, but a function of critical thinking. A persuasive argument is only valid if its logical form is valid and fair. I reject the zeitgeist that it's good speech to use gender-centric pronouns instead of plainly appealing to biology because it appeals to fallacious and unfair reasoning. It is logically coherent and socially permissible for everyone to freely appeal to biology. In fact, it's hypocritical to insist otherwise. Not everyone tries to appropriate their pronouns through valid forms of reasoning like me. There are people that try to bring their pronouns into alignment through an irrational fear of being rude. This is frustrating because there are no accurate words to describe this in English. In Japan, we call this Taishin Kyofo Sho. Disorder, Sho. Of fear, Kyofu. Of interpersonal relationships, Taishin. Taijin Kyufo Sho. TKS is a Japanese culturally specific syndrome wherein people will go through great lengths not to offend anyone. It has various symptoms ranging from mild to severe. Now, I want to clarify, I'm using this as an analogy because it involves the manipulation of thoughts and behavior through cultural norms as we accept them. By deeming that reasoning through politically correctness, or inversely reasoning through outrage is valid and culturally normative, it bypasses individual reasoning altogether, and effectively manipulates the cultural norm that the individual accepts. It's a backdoor persuasive tactic, and it doesn't produce thoughtful or reflective members of society. It makes sheeple. It also produces an undiagnosed culture-specific syndrome wherein individuals go through great lengths to retaliate even if they're offended in the slightest. I'll call him Caitlyn Jenner no, because that's... No, it's her. The... You're not being polite to the pronoun. Because... It's disrespectful. Okay. For... No, well, you but know, wait, to be fair, but to you, be, but to be fair, wait, but to be fair, violence, but, you are, but, are, but to be you fair, you're being, actually being hey guys, rude. You're and horrible. No, no, no. And, and no, that's no, no. not fair. I'm sorry. It's not rude to say that someone who is biologically a male is a male. You just Someone who is biologically sir. male is a male. But Mr. So, Shapiro, you know, you knew very well that saying that to Zoe would be, would be egregiously insulting. Referring to a person as sir punctuated by a non-threatening clarification of word usage has been distorted to be disrespectful and egregiously inflammatory. Please imagine how confusing this must be for non-native English speakers. I propose that we take this time to examine the reasoning behind our notions of offense in relation to communication. Who says what's permissible speech or not, and why is that reasoning valid? It's an age-old question that we don't ask ourselves enough, apparently. We can debate how we feel what's permissible or prohibitive all day, and never reach an agreement. So, presuming you're American, I'm going to examine the reasoning from the common ground that we all share. And that common ground is the law of the land. Since most of us are law-abiding citizens, wouldn't you agree that we appeal to the national standards that bind our freedoms of speech as a tenable way to agree what's socially permissible in regards to pronouns? Well, it's ironic, but what's socially permissible speech by law is restricted by what's considered to be incitement in regards to exceptions to free speech under the First Amendment. This is turning out to be a history lesson, but in 1942, the United States Supreme Court established the Fighting Words Doctrine by a 9-0 decision in Chaplansky v. New Hampshire. 
Writing the decision for the court, Justice Frank Murphy advanced a two-tier theory of the First Amendment to determine whether one applying the contemporary community standards would find that work or deed taken as a whole an act of incitement. It reads, it is well understood that the right of free speech is not absolute at all times under all circumstances. There are certain well-defined and narrowly limited classes of speech, the prevention and punishment of which we have never thought to raise any constitutional problem. These include the lewd and obscene, the profane, the libelous, and the insulting or fighting words, those which by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace. It has been well observed that such utterances are no essential part of any exposition of ideas, and are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit that may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. Resort to epithets or personal abuse is not in any proper sense communication of information or opinion safeguarded by the Constitution, and its punishment as a criminal act would raise no question under that instrument. The application of pronouns is an integral part of speech, reasoning, and possess significant scientific and literary value. Not using the language some trans person wants you to for reasons you don't agree with is protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution and cannot be coerced or mandated legally. In public speaking, this is a classic example of a hostile audience situation in which the peaceful expression of views stirs anger because of the content of expression or the manner in which it is conveyed. Refuting somebody through Heckler's veto is not a valid form of reasoning. In logic, Ben Shapiro was debating using long-term adaptive reasoning. Like gender identity, adaptive reasoning also exists on a spectrum with functioning truths existing on one side and falsities on the other. Long-term adaptive reasoning is essential to debate, critical thinking, and mathematics. The mob insisted Ben ought to use short-term adaptive reasoning by appealing to offense and outrage to serve as valid motivators. Short-term adaptive reasoning can mire any debate and is commonly employed with a logical fallacy, moving the goalpost. But back to the common ground we share, which is the law of the land. There's a place for politically correctness and outrage resulting from social interactions, but these appeals are only warranted if the reasoning is valid or individual freedoms are tread upon. If someone says that they prefer to be called he or she or they or whatever, respect that and do it. No, because nowhere on the grounds of morality are we bound to meet the expectations of another standard of respect, preference, or sense of entitlement. Just because two people don't share the same standard of respect doesn't stem to reason that one person must be rude. It's possible that they just respectfully disagree. Human sex chromosomes were discovered in 1905, while the English pronouns he and she originate in the Proto Germanic language spoken during the pre Roman Iron Age of Northern Europe beginning around 500 BCE. Therefore, by insisting that the singular third person pronouns of the English language refer specifically to karyotype, it is you and not I who is breaking from linguistic tradition. Um, but of course, that's not how pronouns are used. You don't check someone's, you don't do a karyotype test before using someone's pronouns. It's, it's a social. I did that for my yeah. producers before they came on my show. Oh, you, you, yeah. you had the, all of them gen genotyped, yeah, of course. That's right. Yeah. I had them genotyped yeah. as part of a rigorous screening process. Of course, we don't test for karyotypes before speaking to each other. We employ common sense. The fallacy in reasoning employed here is reductio ad absurdum. Nonetheless, this argument is a compound variation consistent with refutation, you don't know what karyotype a trans person has, therefore, any conclusion one might draw conflicting with the presentation of expressed gender is completely illogical. The argument also advances that, since people understood that men and women were different, but not the scientific reason why, we should find it reasonably sufficient to reflect that limited understanding in our use of language and social interactions. In the absence of knowledge about karyotypes, it implies that, it's illogical to reason that, at any capacity, discrepancies between the sexes played a part in the creation or selective process of applying pronouns. Compound fallacies are tricky to spot. Pertaining to the you don't know, therefore X, is an appeal to argumentum ad ignorantum, also known as the appeal to ignorance. And the denial that sexual differentiation played any part in linguistic tradition is refuting through a listing the substitution of identicals, also known as 
The Masked Man Fallacy. I encourage you to look this one up, because it has two layers of reasoning. It's described as a formal fallacy due to confusing the knowing of a thing, which is something called the extension, with the knowing it under all of its various names and descriptions, which is something called the intention. I have to take pause for a moment. I feel like some kind of logical janitor cleaning up this shitty argument. <sighs> the refutation, you don't know what chromosomes I have, therefore my reasoning is completely invalid, fallaciously implies that deductive reasoning alone is the mechanism governing our choice of speech, when in fact it also encompasses inductive and abductive reasoning. You see, every reasonable human functions and adapts by applying a series of statistical evaluations based on finite knowledge. Just because we don't know everything in every instance doesn't mean that we can't make an informed judgment. True, we can't detect karyotypes with the five senses with perfect accuracy, so we appeal to our knowledge that HRT, cosmetic surgery, and voice therapy exist, and are the likely variables correlated to false positives in reasoning. We also can't detect viruses with the five senses, and yet we've done away with using priests to cure ailments. Well, most of us at least. My point is, the reasoning behind how language was appropriated in the past is no longer relevant. It's dogmatic to appeal to what we didn't understand completely then, to be sufficient reasoning for how we should apply our language in the light of a more precise understanding. It's commonly understood that the meanings and thus use of words change based on the context of the times. For instance, the word democratic or democratical was meant as a term of insult, meaning unloyal person in favor of moral rule. But now it means person in favor of modern-day liberalism, among other things. I change my use of words for valid reasons all the time. But I'm not inclined to change my use of pronouns because gender identity is an androgynous nonsense word, and thus biology is the only reasonable distinction to consider. Well, at least in all cases where it applies. It's illogical to regard a trans woman as anything other than a biological man who's expanding or exploring what's part of the male experience. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but changing the use of the word woman to describe a man is as logical as painting an apple orange and expecting me to change my use of the word apple to describe it. Changes in use change to reflect what we have reason to believe, not what we didn't know. What we don't know, or what we're afraid to ask, is a very weak methodology for changing the meaning of words, or communicating any legitimate understanding of anything true, lawful, respectful, or essential. The so-called practicality of gender-centric word usage is predicated on the error-prone nature of presumption and personal concessions and fear of offense in such a way that it inspires it. I've never valued the practicality of the ignorance fallacy in the use of language and reasoning. If I accepted every proposition at face value as an uncontested, unchanging truth based on practicality, I'd be exploitable. As a skeptical person, I never make claims of absolute certainty, and I admit when I'm wrong in response to newer, valid information. For instance, if I called a trans woman her, it doesn't mean that I accept the notion that he was a woman in any sense that may be taken from the word. It just means that I was wrong, and it's okay to be wrong if I'm willing to correct my speech accordingly. If you find such a distinction useful, you might be interested to know, if you don't know already, that physiological sex isn't binary either. It also exists on a spectrum, with typically male people at one end, typically female people at the other, and all sorts of fascinating and wonderful variations in between equals woman xy equals man dichotomy might account for the great majority of people, but it doesn't include everyone. And by the way, neither do the boys have a penis, girls have a vagina, or women make eggs, men make sperm dichotomy. I'd like to point out the nebulous use of the word variations and the implications of the word in between when describing a spectrum. These words serve as a rhetorical smokescreen that obscures any classification of science that could be interpreted as a dichotomy. Well, physiological ambiguities aren't the way we classify different mating types. The reproductive dichotomy, the spectrum argument of AIDS. And yes, it is a dichotomy in Homo sapiens, because every man, woman, and person with disorder of sexual development was conceived through a heterogamous fertilization of male, sperm, spermatozoon, female egg ovum dichotomy. Oogamy isn't just a typical reproductive phenomenon for humans, it's an essential mechanism in the creation of a viable fetus.
condescending tones aside, I don't think anyone denies the existence of intersex people, or more accurately, people with disorders of sexual development. To imply otherwise is an oversimplified straw man meant to score points against people who reject gender identity constructs in favor of biology regarding their social interactions. I appeal to science, and if gender identity is the only one of the three facets of sexual differentiation that applies to people with disorders of sexual development, then I don't have a problem with using the pronouns of that person's presentation in accordance with my own reasoning. But why is sex so sheltered by morality? I have a question, ladies and gentlemen. Is an African American with vitiligo any different from an African American without it? If you can say no, then why? And are you immoral for arriving at that conclusion? If you can say yes, then why? And are you more ethical at arriving at that conclusion? It's by that logic myself and others say that a person can't change their sex. They can change their appearance, but it's only cosmetic. Both males and females have estrogen and testosterone. Prior to the seventh week of development, human embryos have undifferentiated sex organs. Males with AIS, males who have one X and one Y chromosome, are resistant to hormones called androgens. As a result, these people have some or all of the physical traits of a woman. It would be religious to insist that he's a woman because I carried preconceptions of what a woman looked or sounded like. Wouldn't it be more reasonable to modify those preconceptions in light of new information, rather than insulating the fallibility of my senses in words like gender identity? I don't value what I presume as much as what I know or have reason to believe because I can change my mind. Physiologically speaking, the word spectrum confuses everybody by failing to elucidate, and I suspect that we're talking about two systems of classification, or two methods of classifying one system. Intersex variations are examples of divergent sexual development, or more commonly known as disorders of sexual development. They're exceptions to what I'm calling the contemporary definitions and conceptualizations of sex, or CDCS for short. There's over 34 reported types of DSDs in which the mechanisms governing are unique and varied. These anomalies can occur in differentiation, the process of development of the differences between males and females from an undifferentiated zygote, to karyotypes, specifically the addition or deletion of sex chromosomes. There's also a myriad of additional health complications correlated with some of these anomalies. And in this case, I'll describe anomalies as being characterized by, but not restricted to, having one of any three unique forms of chromosomal non-disconjunction, the failure of homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids to separate properly during one of any two types of cell division. Don't dare! Don't make you off this clinical ecstasy! Clearly, a 7.5 on the PP spectrum! Which is why myself and so many people place more stock in chromosomal determination systems. It's more consistent with the contemporary definitions and conceptualizations of sex than, oh say, physiology based on the seeming ambiguity of one's genitalia. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens when you mix social justice warrior politics with science. Someone has to win and someone has to lose. My problem with the refutation through biology is the form of the argument is invalid. Just because one system can't accommodate exceptions to itself, doesn't make it flawed. Just because a different system can accommodate exceptions to that system doesn't make it better, but rather every system of classification is suited for the task it was designed for. If the concept DSD is to retain any meaning, it requires a contemporary definition to provide a standard metric on which to differentiate sex. As a result, it creates the neither or both dichotomy. It's my observation that the contemporary definitions and conceptualizations of sex are essential to phylogenetic taxonomies, and these systems of differentiation exclude anomalous traits that aren't consistent or essential to the species surviving. In humans, it creates the either-or man-woman dichotomy. Now, how to choose a system to base a standard for applying pronouns is a question of how do we know the difference between men and women through the use of common sense, and allow corrective change to that use in light of new information. It's just not tenable to cloud a standard of language around how many ways men and women can be interpreted, or how easily triggered a mind with identity disorder can be. There's over 34 types of DSDs and an indefinite number of gender identities. Biology categorizes men and women by their reproductive status or sex as being members of a distinctive subtype that can potentially exchange genetic information. Intersex is identified as those conditions in which chromosomal sex is inconsistent with phenotypic sex, or in which the phenotype is not classifiable as either male or female. Individuals with these conditions can be sterile or fertile, however, it's taxonomically incompatible to regard DSDs or any other congenital anomaly as a proper subset because it would imply ancestor-descendant relationship. I believe it would fall under a, um, teratological variation. 
An analogous comparison is polydactyly, not to be confused with polydactyly, same word, two systems of classification. Why would they name it the same word? I don't know, but it leads to a lot of public confusion. I decline using pronouns of trans people because they're literally as valuable, and thus true and valid as fallibility will allow. But what vexes me the most about the zeitgeist surrounding gender identity is that it bears a striking resemblance to religious behavior. It's corrosive to critical thinking by making it immoral to change your mind. A person that declines uttering gender-specific pronouns is stigmatized as a bigot, which is tantamount to being called an infidel. And a person who utters trans people's pronouns in spite of what they have reason to believe is seen as virtuous, when in fact it's an act of intellectual prostration. Power over another's utterances, no matter how small or inconsequential it may seem, is addictive. The use of pronouns has nothing to do with respect and everything to do with reasoning. Hell, I use the pronouns of people I don't respect all the time. There are plenty of other arguments I wanted to examine. I wanted to cover an example of the definest fallacy, but I can only take so many bad arguments in one session. I don't expect to deconvert anyone's irrationality overnight. Thomas Paine is credited for saying, To argue with someone who has renounced the use and authority of reason, and whose philosophy consists entirely of holding humanity in contempt, is like administering medicine to the dead, or endeavoring to convert an atheist by scripture. Enjoy, sir, your insensibility of feeling and reflecting. It is the prerogative of animals. Despite these words of wisdom that shall surely prove prophetic in the comment section, I wanted to explain how I've come to reject the reasoning behind what others would have me utter. It's not a progressive idea, and the only way to kill a bad idea is with a rational argument. Thanks for watching.